different possibilities. Uh, I think it's therefore appropriate to start with a quotation from a philosopher played by Jeff Goldblum uh, in the 1993 classic film Jurassic Park. The climactic moment in this film sort of confronts the guy who drew all the dinosaurs and says, your scientists were so preoccupied thinking about what they could do, they didn't stop to wonder if they should. So this is the If They Should panel. We're going to hear first from Stephen Gardner, who's professor of philosophy, and the Ben Lubinowitz professor of the human dimensions of the environment at the University of Washington. And then from David Morrow, who's the director of research at the Forum for Climate Engineering Assessment at American University and a research fellow at the Institute for Philosophy and Public Policy at George Mason University. So we'll start with Stephen. Thank you very much. Thanks to everyone that was here for the invitation. So while we're doing that, it occurred to me that the last time we gave the version of this presentation was to the National Academy panel um, in Washington, D.C. about when we were trying to decide whether to put a report on government here and here. Um, we didn't decide that on the report. But one of the things that struck me was um, these things don't happen very often in this year, but uh, on the panel, so kind of interesting. Um, the session before me was the FBI director talking about um, their worries in the FBI about the rise of China um, and uh, the emergence of maybe a new single um, global power, which would be China, not the US. Um, and I, I thought on that occasion that did affect our discussion of all of this. Technology, because sometimes the American audience is this background assumption. If anyone's going to do it, we're going to do it. But I would say that's not a safe assumption. Okay. So, background why ethics and geoengineering? Well, I think there's widespread agreement that ethical concerns are central to decision making and governance around geoengineering and ultimately the search priority. The Royal Society in the UK said that in its own market in 2009, and so the US By ethics here, I'm thinking very broadly, thinking about concerns of law, and also the law, and the aspiration of economics. I want to emphasize that it's early days for ethics in this area, as well as for science. It's not as though Aristotle gave us the one of the most important um, it's very controversial how to define geoengineering, um, and so what counts and what doesn't count. So I'm going to focus more and more on stratospheric sulfate injection. I'm going to spray sulfates into the stratosphere to provide kind of planetary sunscreen that reflects some of the light out and so on the surface. Here. There's an early literature about um, geoengineering. Uh, it's already reasonably extensive. Um, in that literature, you see a lot of values emerging as relevant. Here's a list of them. It's probably not complete, but it would be the general ideas of this. <coughs> Welfare, whether the benefits and harms, concerns about justice, concerns about rights, especially rights of national self defense. Human relationship with nature, for the uh, intention and responsibility and precaution as part of the science here. Worries about hubris and recklessness, which I think are the first advice. Major worries about political legitimacy, uh, what would justify institutions or people making decisions about geoengineering, concerns about control and domination, what does it mean ethically for someone? So long as the institution has control over the basic climate system. And it affects everyone everywhere, including the whole basic system. And it's a very good process. So, a lot of concerns, one reason I put that up there um, is to emphasize that it's a long list and it includes many values, not just welfare. Because often you'll see in the policy context, people will give you an analysis which tries to show, show you, well, maybe this will be better, this form of geoengineering might be better in terms of human welfare than other 
ways of proceeding. But that's only one value. Right? There are also issues around justice. <coughs> the second issue of point I want to make is that the account um, sort of list of values as a whole pushes us substantially beyond simple economics assessments of geoengineering. Like, let's do a cost-benefit analysis of geoengineering using a standard economic model. Right? There are strong reasons to think that that's not going to <coughs> anywhere near all you care about here. What's going to use the welfare? There are also reasons to think the conventional CBA is not going to be very good at capturing the welfare of concerns that you might have. Right? Conventional CBA has very well known ethical weaknesses for large scale problems in particular, intergenerational problems like climate change, because it has, for example, a very controversial way of dealing with the future. But I also want to point out that many of those values are familiar from other areas. There are things we've talked about and thought about in other areas, so we're not starting from nothing here. Nevertheless, there is a risk that in practice all of this is going to be marginalized. This is not happening in literature, but it won't really have much impact on what happens on the ground and why. I want to start, though, by talking about a way in which we already can marginalize the discussion of the ethical issues in the way we frame the basic discussion. Here's the question I'm often asked, or Steve, you've written a lot about this geoengineering, are you for it or against it? I don't like this. I don't like this way of framing the question. Um, one reason is, on the one hand, and I think this is pretty uncontroversial, I think no one favors geoengineering under just any old circumstances for just any old reason. I don't think anyone, uh, in Majesty, is in favor of geoengineering that's aimed at ensuring the sun will shine. Um, more seriously, this is a very deep consensus against deployment now. I think pretty much almost everyone agrees. We don't yet know enough. Now, on the other hand, I think this is a bit more controversial, but I think you may do anything about it, not that much more. Most can imagine, and imagine is an important word. I'm just talking about fair imagination. Most of us can imagine accepting geoengineering under at least some perhaps unusual and demanding circumstances. So, for example, if we knew in a few decades that we we're right on the edge of a climate cliff, and Captain Kirk shows up right, and says, we have the technology to prevent you going over a climate cliff. We know how to uh, manage the planet. We have thousands of years of experience over millions of planet experience. Even if you don't like it, you're about to tip into a catastrophic situation. We can save you. So I think most of us would at least consider that. So, you know, we consider doing it under those scenarios. But of course, that's not where we are. Right? And that's the movie that's going to be there. So the fact that you could imagine it in a scientific, you know, science fiction movie scenario doesn't mean that you should accept us doing it, us doing it. Right. So um, I'm going to move on to say something about the, uh, the questions I want to focus on just a minute. But first, I want to mention a couple of other, or just one really, other things we want to focus on. Here of the day. Right? Again, we're talking about framing is that prevent us from talking seriously about um, the ethics of geoengineering. So one major claim is when people say, well, we need every tool in the toolkit. Right? This is a huge problem climate change. We should throw everything we can possibly throw at it. Right? And so bait injection is something we can throw at the problem, so we should investigate how to do it. This one I find tricky. I think it's actually misleading because it's not true that everything is currently being considered. Every tool we might deploy is just not being considered right now. There are many things that will make a dramatic difference to climate change. One child policies would make a dramatic difference. A retrenchment in our standards of living, that would make a big difference. We're not even considering those things. 
So it's misleading to, to argue that sort of injection should be in because everything should be in. Um, the second kind of problem related to that is many of those things, like one child policies and so on, so on are out for many people for ethical reasons. Right? They're ethical objections to those things. So there's a risk then of begging the question, because some people think that so that injection should be out for ethical reasons too. So it's not so much that the portfolio of framing is deeply wrong, right? it's that much more argument is required than we shouldn't say. Okay, so what questions do I think we should focus on rather than foreign or whether it's a tool or it's a tool? I think the really salient questions are the justification question, under what conditions do we think geoengineering might become justified? Are they just Star Trek like situations or politics like that? In general. And secondly, and very importantly from my point of view, how relevant are the justification just uh, conditions that we might identify to the world we actually live in, or one that might possibly emerge in the near future. Right. And for me, I think that contextual question here is, is the one that tends to get missed a lot, particularly by the philosophy. We're interested in things that might justify things with you know, very vivid imaginations. We can imagine all sorts of possible worlds. Right? Um, so we tend to get fixated on that. Well, what about justification? How in practice in the early literature do people try to justify geoengineering? engineering? Well, here's an interesting one, which I think is a bad way to try to justify geoengineering, but it pops up in my science It's the idea that doing geoengineering will benefit everybody. And the thought is, well, it benefits everybody. It's clearly just from scientists and from there saying every party would be better off if somebody does geoengineering and if no one does and get Ricky and some other fun scientists saying all regions benefit by the point of a solo in America. I think this is a really misleading thing to say. I think there are major empirical challenges here. Sulfate injection, Many people tell you it is risky, right? There can be lots of bad effects. No reason to assume that all the effects will be absolutely everywhere. Um, I think it's also descriptively implausible for just sulfate injection as such. As Doug already mentioned, geoengineering isn't one thing. Sulfate injection isn't one thing. You can do it at different levels and different ways and so on. It's not magically true that whichever way you do it, it will benefit everyone. Right. Um, so what you'd really be trying to do is pick out a form of sulfate injection that benefits everyone. But how plausible is that? Well, it's not all that plausible. Because you'd be looking, if you really think about it, about a form of sulfate injection that benefited absolutely every person on the planet over a period of at least 100, 200 years, probably much longer than that. It's kind of magical technology that would benefit absolutely everyone at that scale. So that can't be really what we're talking about here. Um, some scientists have major concerns about um, doing geoengineering, including about what the risks are. I put this up so you can get lost. Ray Pierre Humber, who used to be a professor in British Chicago, is now professor at Oxford.
you need to fill in this story. It's an example of why this might be an issue to think about precipitation. Maybe it's true that if you do sulfate injection, right, that in some sense better than better than climate change on the whole, because the climate change will move your precipitation a thousand miles away from where you want it and you know, your cause. But if the sulfate injection only moves it 600 miles, so it's get clear that it's better than it's still not raining over. Right. So there are interesting issues here. But there are also ethically important issues here. The universal benefit seems actually to be the only requirement. One reason is it's too strong. Right. What would we require, especially in the face of some kind of strong threat, that absolutely everyone would be benefited? If we could have a form of geoengineering that protected, you know, um, the world's poor from the most vulnerable from the worst impacts, but cost you and I 50 bucks a year, would that be defensible? <coughs> it might. Right? We can the uh, so it's too strong, but it's also too weak. You might be able to benefit everyone <coughs> only by violating other moral things that you care about. i give a silly example. I'm a messy person. Right? My house is always a mess. A mess. My neighbor's a neat freak. I can't stand the mess house. So one day, he breaks into my house and cleans it. In one way, I'm delighted because I don't like the mess. I'm not clearing it up, but I like it. I was like, I'm hoping it's a clean house. But is what he did justified just because it benefited me and him to clean the mess? No, because he broke into my house. Right? He did things that he's not allowed to do. And there are parallel issues with the contract about might have issues, for example, if another country comes and modifies the climate in a way that benefits us in this country, but without our permission and without any redress from us. We just might have a problem with them to do. Okay. I think actually what's going on is not really in the science of literature and people being able to as such. It's an idea that well, at least sulfate injection is better than we can prevent very, very serious climate change um, or offset by doing this. And here we've got to be careful, because this sort of argument is in danger of being way too easy to get. Because after all, if the worry is we face complete catastrophe, and you say, well, I can do something that makes you better off and makes things better in general than they are in the catastrophe. That's a fairly low bar to satisfy people. <coughs> Often we have a policy that makes things better or better than they would be under climate harm again. Right. Well, lots of things would satisfy that. Maybe climate dictatorship, dictatorship would satisfy that. Maybe um, you know, some kind of carbon dictatorship coupled with we're all living in a slave state, but at least it's not climate harm again. So it's really easy to offer that argument, and I would say lots of more interest to us is not satisfying the catastrophe condition, it's satisfying more demanding conditions. Right? Of a world that we know these people want to actually want to live in. Okay. So my conclusion in this part about the question of justification is that so far, right, the general discussion in the science and policy literature right, needs to get a lot more sophisticated. The tendency is for these quick arguments that make sulfate injection seem really compelling, but if you look at those quick arguments, they're not so compelling. And in particular, we need to pay attention to concerns other than welfare, life, rights, and justice. This is all work for ethics, that's what we use in the other phrase. But I do want to spend a little bit of time on this question. Okay. So I said, how relevant are the justice conditions to identify? to the world we live in, or one that may cause a new version of what's in the future. So some basic issues that emerge here are, well, let's start with the one that's actually somewhat common in the literature around geoengineering. Some people worry about what we're actually talking about here, technological imaginaries. Right? 
we're not talking about um, technologies that really exist that we know how to implement. We're talking about imagined things. And there are major questions about how responsible it is for us to rely upon those kinds of imaginary technologies. For example, there was a huge controversy a few years ago when it was, became clear that the IPCC scenarios um, in which the Paris Agreement was on assume that starting in 2030, which is not that far away, we're going to start sucking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere on a pretty good scale. They assume we're going to start doing that, and then by mid-century we're going to be doing a lot of it. We don't yet know how to do that, and some people complain. So, in mainstream climate policy, we're entitled to assume that a climate uniform will show up and help us. That's a good issue. But the issue I want to emphasize here is we might also be guilty in some of the discussion of assuming the existence of what I call ethical imaginaries, for example, legitimate just global intergenerational institutions. So if we're going to do geoengineering, we need a global international system that's capable of governing it. And governing it in a way that doesn't cause a lot of other problems. But that's, the existence of such a system is not something we're entitled to assume. It might require just as much work to create that as to create the technologies. And of course, the possibilities are in there. But the last thing we have to worry about in basic issues is that we're in a situation of political inertia. You might ask, where are we now with climate emissions? Well, we're way we're way up there, right, in this case, in Well, in 1990, internationally, we agreed that we would prevent dangerous climate change. Right? We start stabilizing the issues. So in 1990, to where we are now, does it look as though we've been doing what we agreed to do? The answer is no, it doesn't. We agreed to do something which has no signs of any real interest in doing it. So you might ask yourself, <coughs> what does that mean for geoengineering policy? If we started in 1990 while really serious about cutting emissions, we wouldn't need to be talking about geoengineering policies. We'd have made some, some, such substantial cuts by now, it would be beyond worrying about that. But the reality is that that isn't what we've done and it's not what we're doing now. We have the Paris Agreement, it's too weak to get us where we need to go. And people are defecting what we need to from the Paris <coughs> So you might ask yourself, how does that background destroy <coughs> what's really available to us, even when it comes to geoengineering? Because we have to ask ourselves a seemingly paradoxical question. It's, what are we ethically obliged to do, given that we've not done and we're continuing not to do what we're ethically obliged to do? Not completely incoherent question, it's a coherent question, but it's paradoxical. Because right. um, you could say, given our predicament, we ought to research sulfate injection. But you could also say, given our predicament, we should be cutting emissions really quickly by now. Right. We should be really going for it, doing everything we can think of, which is what the IPCC is. Absolutely everything we can think of here in conventional climate policy and mitigation adaptation. We're not doing that. So, how does that leave us with this question? Now, unfortunately, I have a view about this. I have a view about what our context is. I'm about it. Um, I'm not going to bore you with the book right now. Just hit some highlights of what the relevance is to here and here. I think. There are strong temptations for the current generation, especially the most affluent, to behave badly with respect to climate change. Passing the buck on to future, the poor people, and the non human nature. I think we lack adequate institutions and theories to defend against those temptations right now. And so the situation is right to abuse, including in how we think and talk about the issue. We like to find ways of thinking and talking about the issue. 
that the sky is the fact that it's my generation <coughs> um, and the Apple Republic more generally who are creating these problems for future generations of um, And I think that's manifest in other areas of well. What's the impact when it comes to thinking about geology? <coughs> Well, I think we should identify some wide threats. The most obvious threats are different countries being Germany. What were their objectives? We can talk about this nice language of people doing things that will magically benefit everyone, but I think we should take seriously the threat that whoever does geoengineering will actually use it as an instrument of national policy or the policy of some elite in order to gain advantages over their rivals, especially geopolitically. Right? Um, it's easy to imagine the past that they go along. That's the most obvious one, but the second one is the one that I want to focus on just for a moment. I think there's a threat of what I call parochial change. Right now, the history of climate policy is saying we're doing very badly at protecting future generations. It's not clear that we're doing anything to protect them against these bad effects of our activities. So why not imagine that if this situation continues, we might pick forms of geoengineering that actually make things worse for these generations? I think we have a history with respect to this problem and say that that won't happen. So we might do geoengineering, but we might do geoengineering that holds off the worst effects for, I don't know, 50, 100 years and maybe makes things worse in the future. So that's the line threat. All of that is another way of saying that the human genetic kind of category is not some kind of measure. What have I said? Well, I said ethics is highly relevant to stratospheric sulfur injection. The large number of highly salient concerns, including welfare, but also justice, where the legitimacy of rights and so on. The early framings, such as the early tool and the universal benefit framings, often marginalize those. I think the sort of injection raises important questions of justification and calls out for meaningful ethical standards to apply. But also, since it's widely held that sulfate injection is on the table as a serious option, mainly because of political inertia, they're interested, sorry, they're also political issues, especially around. And I think that I think the contextual issue seriously to a particular microcosmological analysis helps to highlight some central threats, including the one that I talked about, geoengineering, that we might pick a form of geoengineering that doesn't solve the problem but actually makes parts of it worse. Um, and I think a bunch of the stuff that I've said in there explains why many people hard sulfate injection as a problem. None of what I've said implies that we shouldn't do more research, we shouldn't consider it, but I also think we shouldn't be naive about the problem of the context. Thank you. Slides up. Can I get a show of hands? How many of you were here for the first session? Okay, so a lot of new people. So I will try to provide a little bit more context to fill you in on some of the things that uh, you missed from that first session as we go. Um, okay. I want to try to make the case for geoengineering. But it's going to be a case that's filled with some provisos caveats, because I don't think it's intellectually honest to just make a full perfect case in favor of geoengineering. Before I do that, ooh, this slide took a big mess. Um, let me see how much of a mess it's going to be. Um, okay. No, 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 it's, it's my fault. All right, that's fine. 
So before I make the case for geoengineering, I want to talk about these guys. These are Triassic cyanodonts. Those, those big furry ones in the middle there. Um, they dominated the Earth about a quarter of a billion years ago. And then about 230 million years ago, most of them disappeared. The geological blink of an eye, in the middle of the Triassic. And they disappeared because of something called the Cardian Fluvial Episode. What happened is that something released a huge pulse of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. The likely culprit <coughs> was a series of undersea volcanoes whose remnants you can still see on the coast of Alaska and British Columbia. And this pulse of carbon dioxide warmed the planet probably three to four degrees Celsius. And what had been a relatively cool and dry period of the Triassic transformed into something much warmer, much more humid. Mega monsoons lashed the supercontinent of Pangaea for a million years. When it was over, the cyanodonts were mostly gone. And a kind of critter that you may have heard of took over Pangaea. Dinosaurs. This is what enabled the dinosaurs to take over. Now, if you fast forward 230 million years <laughs> to the early, possibly also the late Anthropocene, we are in the process of doing to ourselves what those volcanoes did to the Triassic cyanodonts. We are transferring huge amounts of carbon from the Earth's lithosphere to the atmosphere. And in the process, we are changing the climate, we are transforming the world. And we are potentially exposing ourselves to very great risks. So what should we do about that? Well, the good news about the fact that this is something we are doing to ourselves is that we can stop it if we would stop it. That is, if we stop moving carbon from the lithosphere to the atmosphere, we can limit how much more warming we cause. And so the first thing we have to do is we have to cut our emissions. Right? If you take nothing else from this day of talks about geoengineering, I want you to learn this, that geoengineering in all of its forms cannot be a silver bullet. It cannot be a replacement for cutting greenhouse gas emissions. There is no reason for that. It must remain the top priority for climate policy. That said, there are other things we might want to do. We might want to adapt to the climate change that we have already caused, and we will continue to cause. Or, I shouldn't say or, and we can start pulling carbon dioxide back out of the atmosphere. This is one of these activities, carbon removal, carbon dioxide removal, negative emissions technologies, these all mean the same thing, that gets lumped under this category of geoengineering. Right? We take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere through various means that range from planting trees to sucking it straight out of the air with a special machine, and we bury it somewhere, and we put it back underground where we found it. Another option, the one that Steve spent most of his time talking about, is called solar geoengineering, or solar radiation management. The basic idea here, uh, which Doug explained in detail this morning, is that you want to reflect a little bit of incoming sunlight back into space before it can warm the planet to counteract the warming that we are causing to our greenhouse gas emissions. So here's the case for doing those things, one or both. We know that carbon removal could lower climate risk. And we have some pretty good reasons to believe that solar geoengineering, if used wisely, might be able to lower climate risk. And lower climate risk is this sort of public policy deep talk. But what it means 
is that we are reducing the amount of harm, the amount of risk that we are imposing on other people and on ecosystems. This is tremendously morally important. This is one of the great moral challenges of the 21st century. And when you just say reducing climate risk, it doesn't sound that important, but it absolutely is. So carbon removal and probably solar geoengineering give us a way as a supplement to cutting emissions to reduce climate risk. Furthermore, we've heard a little bit about this already today. Let's assume for the sake of argument that justice requires us to at least meet the goals set out in the Paris Agreement of limiting global warming to well below 2 degrees Celsius, ideally below 1.5 degrees Celsius. I think that's a plausible assumption. The bad news is that we can't do that without carbon removal. At least we can't do it for 1.5 degrees. So this IPCC report, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report that came out last month that we've heard about several times today, looks at what it would take to limit warming to one and a half degrees, and one of the conclusions is that we cannot do it with emissions reductions alone. We can't do it without emissions reductions, but we can't do it with emissions reductions alone. We need at least a bit of carbon removal, and probably a lot. The IPCC's fifth assessment report from a few years back says that we probably can't get to two degrees either without carbon removal. So it looks like there are few, if any, feasible pathways from where we are now to where justice requires us to be. And there are plenty of feasible pathways, imaginable futures, quite plausible futures, I think, where we can't get to two degrees, much less one and a half degrees, without at least a bit of solar geoengineering, too. If we don't cut emissions quickly enough, if we don't scale up carbon removal quickly enough, solar geoengineering might be the only way to reach those targets. A lot of people would leave the case for geoengineering there. They'd say, look, it can reduce climate risk, there is no other way to get to these targets that we've set for ourselves, so a lot, we've got to do it. But that is radically incomplete as an argument for geoengineering. Just because something will get you to a goal that you set for yourself isn't a sufficient reason to think you should do it. Just because something is the only way to get you to a goal that you've set for yourself is not a sufficient reason to think you should do it. Because it might be that the reasons against whatever activity you've chosen are actually stronger than the reasons for sticking to that goal. In other words, if you accept that the end does not always justify the means, then it's not enough to say geoengineering is the only means to our end, so we have to do it. You also have to look at and confront the arguments against carbon removal and the arguments against solar geoengineering to see whether they outweigh the arguments in favor of limiting warming to one and a half or two degrees. So let me take those two things in turn, carbon removal and solar geology. There is so much we could say about this. You've already said a lot of it. So I'm going to limit myself to a few brief remarks about specific method-specific problems, and then a provocative analogy about the problems with carbon removal in general. So there are somewhere on the order of a dozen live proposals about how we might pull carbon out of the atmosphere, depending on how finely you want to slice them. And every one of those methods has downsides. Some have co-benefits, but they've got downsides too. And those downsides tend to be scale-dependent and context-dependent. In other words, the more uh, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage you do, the bigger the problems get. The context in which you do it matters. And so I think the, those are real problems. I think they are manageable. I think 
They are manageable in large part by pursuing a portfolio of different approaches. You don't want to put all your eggs in one basket in this case. Um, but to really get into those, we sort of have to get down in the, the weeds of here are the different technologies and here why there are problems. So I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to talk about Russian roulette instead. <laughs> Steve alluded to this argument that people have made, where they say, look, if we make climate policy today on the assumption that we are going to start pulling carbon out of the atmosphere within a few decades, and that by late in the century we're going to be pulling tens of billions of tons of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, we are taking an unjust high stakes gamble on it. Because we don't know that we'll be able to do that. And so if we make <coughs> climate policy today on the assumption that we will do that and we turn out to be wrong, we will have stuck future generations. But when I say future generations, what I really mean is that you, with your real age, sorry, Bill, um, will have stuck future generations with much worse climate change than they would have faced had we started cutting emissions now. So the philosopher Henry Hsu came up with this analogy to try to dramatize this situation. Right? If you've taken a philosophy class or two, you probably know that philosophers like to come up with these very dramatic uh, situations. They often involve people dying in horrible ways. Uh, so I apologize on behalf of my discipline, but here we go anyway. Uh, look at the person next. Imagine that I took a six-shooter revolver. I put one bullet in one chamber and I gave it to the person next to you. And I said, I want you to point this at the person next to you. And remember, that's you. And I want you to pull the trigger. And if you do, I will give you thousand dollars. <laughs> Raise your hand if you think the person next to you would be justified in pulling that trigger for a thousand dollars. Exactly. This would be a horrible thing to do. And Shu thinks that this is a good analogy for that high stakes gamble on carbon removal for a couple of reasons. You are the one deciding, sorry, the person next to you, the person with the gun is the one deciding whether to take the risk. There's a benefit to them, but it's not that big a benefit. It's not a life-changing benefit. But it is a life-ending risk for you. And so, Shu says, if you don't think the person next to you should pull that trigger, then you also don't think that we should bet the future on carbon removal. I'm telling you about this analogy because I think it's a terrible analogy. I could spend a long time talking about why I think it's a bad analogy, uh, but I want to focus on just a few things. First of all, I would point out that this does not offer an argument about carbon against carbon removal in general. It's an argument not to delay emissions reductions because we think we can clean them up later. But I, I think I mentioned this, we shouldn't do that. That we should start cutting emissions right away, that that's really important and we can't just focus on that. So this only applies, this analogy only applies to particular aspects of carbon. But there are two other problems with it. One, this is sort of the boring one, uh, I think it's actually greatly inflating the risk that we will not be able to pull carbon removal out of the air. To me, it seems rather implausible that none of the various methods we've proposed would work at large scale. So the risk is actually much smaller than one in six. And in fact, I'll bet that they're on the order of the kinds of risks that we take for gains that are probably smaller than $1,000. Every time you get in your car to drive somewhere, you not only take risk upon yourself, you impose it on others. The more interesting thing, I think, is that Shu's analogy uh, underestimates the, the, or it obscures the fact that humanity is not a single unitary actor responding to climate change. 
It's seven and a half billion people as of now living in very different circumstances. Let's try to stick with the analogy a little bit. There are plenty of people on this planet, literally billions of them, for whom $1,000 is a life-changing amount of money. And I think that's important because I think one of the questions about carbon removal is whether we might want to use it to clean up carbon emissions from what are now very poor countries who might want cheaper but dirtier energy to help their people lift themselves out of poverty. Now that's not an ideal situation, I'd say. The ideal situation is that uh, the rich world should pay for those countries to develop through clean energy. But we're, we're not very good at that so far. And so I think if the question is, do we allow some countries to continue to develop using cheaper but dirty energy, and then pull carbon back out of the atmosphere later, that's a lot more plausible. And that takes us pretty far from Shu's analogy. So Steve has warned us against thinking that the case for geoengineering is as simple as some people make it. I want to warn you against thinking that the arguments against it are as simple as other people make it. Let me say a little bit about solar geoengineering uh, with another metaphor. I think Doug in particular is going to hate this one, at least at first, but, but hear me out. Okay. Uh, I'm going to stick with the gun. So, solar geoengineering, this idea of reflecting sunlight back into space, to cool the planet. Uh, it can work fast, it's temporary, uh, and it's riskier than carbon removal. It's not going to get us back to the climate we had before, not exactly. It gets us to a different climate, one we're not familiar with. And I agree that we now know enough to say that that might reduce climate risk overall. We can imagine scenarios in which it would be useful. I want to say that, that solar geoengineering is a little bit like a new kind of bulletproof vest that we haven't tested. <coughs> it's a little bit like a bulletproof vest in a, in a couple different ways. One, a bulletproof vest is useful when things are going really badly. This is the kind of technology, the kind of response to climate change that we might use if things are going really bad. But if you recall when I made my initial case for geoengineering, uh, I said that geoengineering, solar geoengineering, could reduce climate risk if it's used wisely. Steve alluded to this too. Here's a big question about whether it would be used wisely. So you could imagine people to whom you could give a bulletproof vest and they would use it wisely, but you could also imagine people uh, who would think, oh, cool, I'm invincible. And they would either put themselves in much more dangerous situations than they otherwise would. Or maybe they would actually use it in sort of predatory ways. Right? They'd say, well, look, no one can hurt me now, so now I can go make other people do what I want them to do. You can imagine bad actors with a bulletproof vest. And so the worry about solar geoengineering, yeah, there are these sort of technical scientific worries, maybe we're wrong about how well it would work, Right, maybe this new kind of bulletproof vest won't actually stop a bullet. And then, of course, if, if you're facing too much gunfire, a bulletproof vest isn't going isn't to save you anyway. But then there are the concerns that solar geoengineering would be used badly. I want to add a little bit more context, just as Steve did at the end. And to do that, I want to go back to the Sonodons. I promise there was, in fact, a reason I told you about them, other than um, that I like them. And it's that I think the context of our climate change matters more as compared to theirs. So theirs was something over which they had no control, <coughs> that they did not cause themselves. 
And so I think it would be a much clearer case, a much easier case, if the synodons had had the, the or triastic synodons had had the intelligence, and the science, and the technology, and the opposable thumbs <laughs> to use carbon removal for solar geology. But they would have had a much stronger case to do it. But for us, it matters that we would be intervening in Earth systems intentionally. Intentions matter in ethics, they matter here. And it matters that we would be intervening in Earth systems to address a problem that we ourselves have created. And that we need to keep that in mind when we think about the ethics of geoengineering, and especially the ethics of solar geoengineering. To motivate that last thought, let me leave you with one other hypothetical situation. It's one thing to give someone a bulletproof vest because you know that someone is going to be shooting at them. It is a very different thing, morally speaking, to give someone a bulletproof vest because you are shooting at them. They should be much less grateful in the second case. Thanks for your attention. Also, 
not quite so sure about the important question was, what is this non-welfare good that's at stake? Well, actually, I think it's a long, long list, right? Welfare was one, right? But there was justice, there was political legitimacy, blah, blah, blah. So I would say, I mean, you, know, you asked the question because you're looking for the what's the intrinsic thing. But I would say it's, it's already clear there are lots of other morally relevant things at stake that are not um, welfare as such. But let me say just a couple of things, you know, now I'm going to undermine myself by encouraging the black market approach. <laughs> right. But I, I do think there are some things that, um, why they may not be exclusive to geoengineering, um, and why they might not be decisive or wrong in every, any, every uh, any part of the world, are still normatively very interesting about geoengineering. One, of course, the most obvious one is what it means for the human relationship. And there's a literature on this. We turn significant parts of the natural world, maybe, into things that we control and perhaps create. We've made one of the world artificial. This seems another step along that path. And some people have serious ethical concerns about that. How big do we want the role of humanity to be? Do we really want to take over absolutely everything? Right, and that's concerns about our relationship to the rest of nature. And here, of course, I have concerns about the amount of control and impact we have on the lives of non-humans all around the world. Right. So those come up. But the one that, the other one that I want to mention that does come up is whoever does stratospheric sulfate injection, I think, has a large amount of control, but also a profound kind of control over the basic circumstances in which other people on the planet live, potentially over many generations. So it's a huge exertion of a kind of political power, which I sometimes call a profound politicization of not just the climate system, but the natural world itself. That might be on a spectrum with other things, but I think it is at least somewhat distinctive. And it's further down that Sure, I just wanted to add one other argument that people make about intrinsic wrongness, and it applies, uh, as I think most of those thoughts do, most of the solar geoengineering. I think the sort of intrinsic wrongness arguments against uh, carbon removal are, are much weaker, you sort of run into them much less, much less frequently. But the one argument I wanted to add is that people often object that solar geoengineering amounts to a techno-fix to what's really a social problem. And there are lots of people who will say, okay, the fixed part sounds good. What's, what's the issue here? And, and I myself am more in that camp, right? Okay, techno-fix, good, because the social problem is really hard. But if, in case that the techno-fix argument doesn't grip you, let me try to motivate it a little bit. At least make it more understandable. So, on the one hand, there is a clear sort of public health argument for uh, distributing condoms on college campuses because it reduces the rate of STIs and unwanted pregnancies. But there are going to be people who are going to be profoundly uncomfortable with this. Right? They're going to say it is a techno-fix it enables people to keep doing things that they shouldn't be doing in the first place. Now, you might not think that that's doing anything that you shouldn't be doing in the first place. Um, but this is at least a familiar example of the kind of argument that people make against the technical fix. And so the analogy here is that if you think that we shouldn't be putting carbon in the atmosphere in the first place, that we shouldn't be disrupting uh, various ecosystems that we use to extract fossil fuels and so on. Or if you think the problem is global capitalism in general, then anything like solar geoengineering that sustains those kinds of activities is going to be seen as a problem. A technical solution that enables people to keep doing something that they shouldn't. And so that, I think, is one reason that people think that it's intrinsic. I'll let you come back to the research question in a minute, but what you just said makes me think. Um, 
I also had a question about how different agents should understand their relationship to this problem. So you both use the language of we. Um, what should we do in these circumstances? And, and I guess the question here um, for scientists as well as for ordinary people is, who's the we? Is it an agent and carry after? So philosophers sometimes talk about kidnapper arguments and the way that the strength of a moral argument can depend on who's making it, right? So if a kidnapper says to me, uh, if you want your child back, you better pay the ransom, it seems like a morally horrendous argument because it's the one making it the case that I have to pay the ransom by violating his obligations. But it doesn't seem wrong for my friends or for police officers to advise me to pay the ransom in order to get my child back, treating as a constraint the fact that the kidnapper has already violated his moral obligations. I wonder if there's a case to be made that scientists could see themselves in the same kind of role. That while it would be objectionable for political actors to say that we should fund geoengineering because we aren't going to act on mitigation, is it similarly unpersuasive for scientists to say we should do research on geoengineering because political actors aren't going to act on mitigation? Can you give the mic to the guy who wrote a paper on this? I mean, I think just the general issue of the media and how we're all responsible for this is very important and interesting. And it confronts us in different ways. I mean, for scientists, I think there is their situation with respect to geoengineering is a tricky one as a community. I mean, you tend to hear more if you're in the geoengineering community or from scientists who are in favor of pursuing geoengineering. Why? Because there's a strong selection bias. If you're a scientist who's not interested, you're not in that community, right? You're doing other stuff. Right. But moral arguments about what the scientists should be doing are interesting in part because of my paradoxical question. Right? Because there's this background of, well, you asked us to tell us what you needed to do as a community. We told you starting 25 years ago, we keep telling you, you need to cut these emissions, you need to blah, blah, blah. And now you're not doing any of that. In fact, you're making it much worse. So you're asking us again, what should we do? Some scientists are prepared to say, well, we should pursue this. But some scientists don't want anything to do with it. They say, well, we already told you what to do, and you just wouldn't do it. So it's not a moral obligation on me to tell you what to do now. Right? I mean, think about how this might be that, suppose we don't do mitigation, we don't do um, adaptation. We don't do anything to research on this in 20 years' time. Is there a moral obligation for scientists to tell us? Well, what do we do now? Um, I don't know. I, I can see the point of view of the scientists who just throw up their hands um, But there's so much at stake that I can see the point of view of the scientists who says, no, don't really like all this. Mitigation should be first, that's pretty much everything it says. Right, but I'm going to try to help out a bit more. So there's some question about how low can we go. Because right. um, I said that there are actually lots of things we could do that would cut emissions, that they start to change to more, the more radical and less savory edge. But it's difficult for you and your generation. You're in a funny sort of position, I would say. I'm guessing this is a question of Matt's view, but I thought it would be my responsibility here. In one way, you're in a good situation because you're a lot younger than me, so you can't be accused of being in a generation that's basically failed to do what needs to be done. Right? The future is open for you. On the other hand, you're stuck with a situation where things are a lot worse than they were. Right? And bad things are going to happen, can keep happening on the ground. My brother-in-law luckily survived, but just lost his house and he every possession in Paradise, California. Two weeks ago. Anyway, so there are going to be more impacts on the ground. So what are you going to do? Well, I mean, I spoke to people like you 20 odd years ago about this problem. And they haven't managed to change things all that much. So you've got a big challenge ahead of you. My generation didn't have to change things that much. My advice would be, do whatever you can. See where your talents are for making a contribution to this problem, and exercise them. But don't think that, you know, just taking short sure showers and so on is to solve this problem. You're going to need massive political change.
Think of yourselves like this, and this is you know, going to be an incendiary thing to say to some people, but heck, I'm, I'm kind of I'm just being um, sensitive about this. But I feel like we're, we're in the 1930s. It's coming. It's already parts that you can see. They can see it happening in the 1930s. That's why I think it's unfolding in front of us. And I think we have to realize that. And stop pretending that it's not. Sorry, thank you, um, On the question of who is this we that we keep talking about, I think that's a really important question to keep in mind when we're thinking about climate change generally and when we're thinking about geoengineering. Um, let me just say that. I think it would matter tremendously who is deploying solar geoengineering. Right? Is it, uh, there, there used to be a lot of discussion, or these early framing things, about rogue nations deploying geoengineering. There's a big meeting where someone said, you know, whenever someone says rogue nations deploying geoengineering, uh, it makes you think about, I don't know, North Korea doing it. But the much more plausible scenario is that the rogue nation deploying geoengineering <coughs> over the objections of the rest of the world is going to be us. And that would matter. Is it the United States over the objections of the rest of the world? Is it a coalition of powerful countries? Is it someone acting on behalf of the entire UN who has unanimously voted to do this? Right? Those are more than very different scenarios. And it would be very different if it's the United States doing it because we didn't cut our carbon emissions, or if it's a coalition of small island states doing it because otherwise they will literally cease to exist. So who is we it matters greatly when we think about the ethics of deployment. Steve's talking a bit about why it matters uh, for research as well. So I think that's a very important question. We'll go to some questions from the audience now. Someone asks whether you can say more about why cost-benefit analysis is bad at capturing the effects on human welfare of, in of interventions like geoengineering. Okay, so there's a, there's a big literature on what's wrong with cost-benefit analysis. Um, I think first we have to be a bit careful about what we mean by cost-benefit analysis, right? because the term is used in different ways. <coughs> I'm using it to mean analysis of a problem using the techniques of standard economic theory. <coughs> we value things in terms of like market prices um, and you uh, deploy a discount rate for evaluating the future, which essentially, you know, says everything that happens in the future is um, less valuable than what happens today at a rate of generally somewhere between 2 and 5% per year. <coughs> There are some fundamental issues with that methodology, especially for long-range problems like climate change. For example, in the normal sort of rate of 5%, um, people typically assume that 2% of that is just our preference to get things now, early. Right. So we say things matter less in the future because we prefer to get them now. That seems morally problematic when you're talking about things that happen to future people. We can take their concerns a lot less seriously just because we prefer stuff now. Moreover, this issue dominates economic models of climate change and their responsibility to geo There have been huge spats about how to value climate change for the economics community, but a huge part of those facts are about this issue of how we value the future of what's this kind of And my view is that those issues are fundamentally ethical issues. You yeah. don't get to you know, point guns towards the future by rushing to the future and discount the cost to them at a rate of 5% per year in large part because uh, you think they matter. That's the sort of thing I have in mind. 
I'm less pessimistic about cost-benefit analysis than, than Steve is, but yeah, there, there are big problems and um, seemingly really technical things like the discount rate make huge differences. Um, so one of the big debates in climate policy has been between William Nordhaus, who just won the Nobel Prize for Economics, largely because of his cost-benefit analysis of climate change. Um, and Nicholas Stern, and the, the basic difference in their conclusions is that Nordhaus says, or at least he used to say, he's moderated this, that we just shouldn't do very much right now, and that we should tolerate a fairly large amount of climate change because it's expensive to mitigate. Well, it's not actually that expensive. It's just that the costs are all in the future. That is the downside cost of climate change. Uh, whereas Stern takes basically the same analysis, puts in a much lower discount rate, and says, we need to get on this now. This is urgent. Totally different conclusion because of this seemingly arcane little thing that is, in fact, tremendously more important. Right? And, and is a normative decision in the economic world. Could the emergence of a new theory really motivate us to take appropriate action? Yeah. Uh, so a couple of things going on there. One, about the question about motivation. Like, there are quite different views about that. Uh, historically, philosophy, and in contemporary climate ethics. So could a theory motivate us? Well, some people think, and philosophers think, that moral motivation works by well, when you recognize what the truth of the situation is, you'll be motivated to act in the right way. Right? So yes, in that picture, a theory to motivate us. That's how the world is. And um, we are primed to act morally. On another view, we can perfectly well recognize the truth of the theory, or some facts, and so on, and recognize that We'd be behaving very badly if we ignored those things, and we could just carry on doing it. For example, because we're just not very good people. Um, so, I must admit, I tend to get towards the second view. I think it's very important to recognize what's going on, recognize what we should normally do, and all this kind of thing, and not do it. Um, but it raises interesting questions. Well, just as a side point, years ago, um, a very well-known um, social scientist sent me a draft of a short paper she was doing at a conference where she argued that the problem of inaction within the United States works a bit like this like around climate change. Climate change poses a major threat to lots of vulnerable people and the future generations and the rest of nature. If, um, if we act in a way that exacerbates that threat, then we must be morally bad people. We're not morally bad people. Therefore, the climate science must be wrong. Right. Sadly, I think the climate science is oh. But I can also see how motivationally it might be hard for us to accept. For that reason. Like, we are attracted to that argument. And I think one of our problems is we all talk to each other, right? We're all around assessing each other, right? And we all engage in the same practices and so on. So. It doesn't seem so bad for us. We like to make lots of excuses for ourselves and individually. I have a feeling that future generations and people around the world, but future generations of our own population, are going to be a lot less kind in their assessment of what we do. I think we should find that movement. As a people call, are we the scum of the earth? Where the argument is basically, I think it matters to us. Well, you know, how other people think of us. 
including you know, future generations, our own descendants, but also more broadly, future generations of Americans think, oh, okay, that was generation scumbag that inflicted this stuff on us and threatened the public. I, I think we care about that. I think we'd be motivated to actually do that. Um, so that would be a useful thing. <laughs> There might be some <coughs> cause for hope here uh, in the rather unhopeful fact that these impacts are getting closer and closer. So when the world agreed in 1992 to limit global warming, like a lot of these projections were out to 2100, and if you were a senior diplomat or a senior scientist working in 1992, 2100 seems a really long time away. Some of you will live to see 2100. My kids will live to see 2100. So when we're talking about bad impacts in 2100, those are things that are going to happen to people that you know. You might not know them yet, but you will. And those bad impacts will happen to them. And the impacts that we're worried about before then, the ones that are coming down the pike in 20, 30 years, those will happen to you. And I think as that thought starts to dawn on people, this talk of future generations will become a lot less uh, abstract. And it's not that we're protecting people who don't exist yet and whose lives will not overlap with our own. We are protecting ourselves and our kids and our grandkids. And yes, people whose lives don't overlap with our own. And I think adding that last part does matter, because it does matter for the very long-term effects of climate change. Um, so it might be that the, the motivation has changed for us, just by the time doing what time does. I'm going to group together a couple of questions that I think touch on the relationship between the epistemic and the whole issues here. So, one person asks, what if the only way we can reduce climate risk is in a way that's asymmetric? Does it matter that everyone benefits or is prevented from being harmed to the same degree, especially given that geoengineering and limiting emissions might impose burdens of cost unequally? Second person asks, how we should evaluate the risks of unknown and or unintended consequences of geoengineering in the context of the dire consequences of abstaining from action? Um, Maybe just to repackage both of those as sort of action items for potential researchers here. I would ask, what kinds of reduction in uncertainty um, or advancements in knowledge would make a difference to the like positions on geoengineering? Where could we fill in some of the unknowns in ways that matter? Okay, uh, I kind of want Doug to answer this question. Um, <laughs> So absolutely, the, the distribution of impacts matters. And I take it, Duncan, correct me if this is just totally off base, that the distribution is likely to be different between a sort of high climate change world and a high climate change cooled by, or high greenhouse gas cooled by solar geoengineering world. But the distribution would be different. Uh, but even if, sort of on aggregate, and again, this is even if, on aggregate, people are better off in that geoengineered world. Uh, there might be some people who are made worse off by that transition, some people who would actually be better off. We may or may not be able to know in advance who those some people are, but the distributions would, would differ. And so one thing I suppose that would certainly inform my views about solar geoengineering is knowing more about those distributions of, of impacts. Um, yeah, thanks. I'm, I'm going to jump to the more theoretical, I think, but in a way which I think is relevant here. So, um, a philosopher in the, the UK, Megan Blomfield, wrote a paper a few years ago arguing that actually more information about impacts and the exact geographic distribution might make things worse rather than better for decision making from the moral point of view. Uh, because once people 
know a lot more about who will be affected and precisely how, they might be a lot less willing to cooperate in various ways in solving the problem. Sometimes ignorance about how you personally stand to be affected or how your country stands to be affected is actually good news for getting a fairer outcome. There's a classic example of this. Do you have any philosophy in the world of the scientists? Um, John Rawls has a, a famous theory of justice which rests, has this idea that we should make judgments about fair, fairness from behind a veil of ignorance. Right? We don't know exactly who we're going to be in society um, when we choose what the rules of fairness should be. And the reason he, think that's, he thinks that's a good idea, it's a powerful tool, is because then we have to take very seriously the idea that we might be anybody in society. So we have to faithfully represent the interests of everybody because we might end up being them once the veil is lifted. And maybe we can talk a little similar kind of idea about some of these things around climate impacts and geology. It might be better to generate some basic rules of fairness when you don't know whether you're going to be on the sharp end or the relatively comfortable end. Because once you know what's powerful opponents in particular, know that they're going to benefit, then they and then they're not liable to some of those severe risks, then they're like, they're not going to So that's, that's one theoretical issue. The second theoretical issue, though, is like, what's a fair distribution here? I mean, we get through a lot of this language of better off, right? And particularly, you know, my friends in politics often say, you have to persuade people, right? That they're not going to be many more soft. In fact, they're going to be many better off by whatever is climate proposal. I find that a little bit tricky, morally. One thing is, well, better off than, than what? By what baseline do you see? Better off than you are now? Better off than you could be if we maximally pollute through your lifetime? Right? Regardless of what happens to you You know, what? Better off in the sense of you just have a reason to be able to pay life? Right? What kind of, what's your, what's your baseline? Because some baselines look a bit outrageous. You might say, well, I'm not going to do anything to help future generations and impose any severe risks on them. They might face climate Armageddon, but in order to do anything about that, I need to be persuaded that I will become better off than under any other plan. That looks a little weird. I mean, think of a parallel. Suppose we found out that the pesticides we're using right now are going to cause severe genetic deformities. For Oh, sorry, severe deformities through genetic effects in three or four generations. Nothing's going to happen between now and then, but it's really going to be bad. Would our reaction would be to say, hmm, that's very interesting, but we're not going to stop using those pesticides that are useful to us unless you could persuade us that you're going to do it in such a way that makes us better off than we are using them. I think we're looking at Right? These are the sorts of harms we are not entitled to inflict. And if it costs us something right, to stop doing it, then it costs us something. We just have to stop using it. Now, maybe there's some limit at which we have a kind of right to self-defense, right? Stopping using them, we would actually all stop. <coughs> then we say, okay, so out of self-defense, we've got to keep using them just a little bit longer. And just because it worked really hard to get off and all, we could say all these things, but still the imperative would look very bad. I think we're in that kind of situation when it comes to So I'm very suspicious of these arguments that say, no persuasion, they'll be better off through the transition. I'll just add a, a couple of thoughts here on that, that last point. It's worth noting that there's one way to think about making someone better off. Not by saying, well, you'll be a richer person, or you'll be a healthier person, or you'll be uh, a more famous person, but that you will be a better person. <coughs> that is a morally better person if you do this rather than the other thing. And I think in sort of public debates that often gets lost, whereas in private decisions, it's often a big factor. And we don't want to do something because we would be morally worse people to do it. I also want to go back briefly to the question about unknown <coughs> There's something, uh, an, an important thought here about how we manage uh, the manage risks where we don't know how likely they are to happen. And the way this is often articulated is in something called the precautionary approach, the precautionary principle, but it turns out there's no one principle there. 
as many different ways of doing it as there are people trying to apply it. But the basic thought here is that if you are facing a risk where you don't know how likely it is to happen, but you know it would be really bad if it did happen, then you ought to take precautions to ensure that it won't happen. This is actually one of the things going on in, in Rawls' argument. As a general decision procedure, this turns out to have lots of problems, right? You should never leave your home because you might get hit by a car, uh, but you also shouldn't stay in your home because it might get hit by an asteroid. Um, so you kind of got to get more nuanced here. But what I want to say about precaution and geoengineering is that precaution cuts both ways with respect to both carbon removal and at least solar geoengineering research. So I talked about the argument that in some sense it's a precaution-based argument that says, look, we shouldn't make climate policy as if carbon removal is going to save us because that's being reckless. We're not being appropriately cautious about the possibility that carbon removal won't materialize at scale. But you could run this the other way, too. We don't want to just ignore carbon removal. We don't want to leave it for later in the century, given how long it takes to scale these things up. Because to do that is to make carbon removal policy as if emissions reductions will save us in time. And as people have been pointing out, our track record on that isn't great. So precaution, I think, requires us, in the case of carbon removal, to do two things that are difficult to do at the same time. We've got to make climate policy, mitigation policy, emissions reductions policy as if carbon removal won't save us. And we've got to make carbon removal policy as if emissions reductions won't save us. A similar kind of thought applies to solar geoengineering. A lot of people say we shouldn't even talk about this because there are these risks that it will deter people from cutting emissions, that it will put us on a slippery slope towards deployment, and deployment could turn out to be really bad. So let's not start down that path. That's a precaution-based argument. But you could also run the sort of argument that Doug alluded to earlier this morning when he said, look, if we don't do the research now, we could face a situation in 20 years where someone says, hey, remember that thing that people were talking about 20 years ago where we spray stuff in the stratosphere and it cools the planet? Yeah, things are really bad. Let's do that. Doug comes out of retirement to say, no, 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 we never figured out if it's going to work or how to do it well. And you can easily imagine people say, well, we're going to find out. And that's a dangerous situation to be in, too. So I think precaution cuts both ways on solar geoengineering as well. We need to be careful about where we're headed, but we also don't want to, to recklessly cast it aside. Last thing on, on this. I, yeah, I think the precaution, so the, I'm one of those people who's written on precaution as one of the views. Um, I think it's tricky in the case of geoengineering because um, usually in precautionary cases, you're thinking of what? Of securing through your precautionary action a kind of safe exit from the situation. Right? And you're willing to give things up to secure that safe exit. But it's not clear that opening the door to geoengineering is a safe exit. You can imagine that it might be. You can imagine that we have a non-paper quality. We have a president of the earth, Her Majesty, you know, not Majesty, Her Eminence, <laughs> virtue incarnate in you know, 2070 or something. And we have a wonderful geopolitical system that's full of checks and balances and you know, can deliver beautiful foreign policy. Right. And she gets to make the decision. And then it will like, seem pretty safe, okay, you know, I'm glad we developed this technology that she could deploy. But we also might find ourselves in a situation where the person deciding is, you know, the president of big country X, right? Who's thinking to himself, well, this would be a good way to take control of the global system. This would be very useful to kind of technology to have control of when it's this trade war, right? Um, and there, it might not be a bit like supplying the future with the best. It might be like supplying whoever that is in the future, you know, President Adolf or whatever, with a new reason. And you might not want to do that. You might think 
that's not a safe exit. That's actually making things potentially much worse. I think people can reasonably disagree about that. But I think there's that disagreement. Time we have, but before you make to the safe exits, please join me in thanking both of our panelists.